Thanks very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here today. This map of the world shows that there are 45 countries that have over 10% of their population made up of individuals not born in that country. The UN estimates that there are over 244 million people around the world that are living in countries that they weren't born in. Here in the UK, it's one in eight of the population, which means that in this room here, there are probably 30 of you that weren't born in, in this country or in, in the UK. Now, migration, I believe, is a neglected determinant of health, most depressingly and horribly witnessed by the drownings that we've seen in the Mediterranean this summer. But it's more subtly a determinant of health as well. For example, we see poor outcomes in our maternal and child health in women in London who book for their pregnancies late and have poor outcomes as a result of that. What I'm going to talk today about is tuberculosis and tubercul migration as a determinant of tuberculosis. What you'll notice from this graph here, which shows the tuberculosis prevalence in countries, is that actually most of the low incidence countries have the highest number of migrants. And what I'm going to try and look at today in this research that I'm going to present to you that I've been working on is trying to understand could, could innovation in migrant screening for tuberculosis contribute towards the goal of tuberculosis elimination within low incidence countries. Now I was delighted to hear this morning of another uh, from the keynote speaker that there's someone else that has quite a chaotic and varied career such as I've had. I originally trained in mechanical engineering and worked for a little while as an investment banker, something which I don't admit to many audiences, so please don't tweet it if you are. <laughs> Before I realised that I was going wrong and I went back to medical school and, and did an MSc in epidemiology. But the benefits of that rather chaotic and very, very career mean that I've been able to bring together some methodologies that maybe some medics don't have. And so the research that I'm presenting today builds upon some of those skills that I've developed, starting with the systematic review and using then probabilistic data linkage to undertake a cohort study using DNA fingerprinting methods and finally undertake some mathematical modelling to understand this question of whether innovation of, in migrant screening could contribute towards TB elimination in low incidence countries. Now if we're thinking about migrant screening for tuberculosis, it's just helpful to think about the natural history for TB. So I'm sure you're all aware, but TB has this long latent period when someone's in, been infected with the microbacteria. And the type, at which point they have no symptoms, they're, they're unaware probably of that infection unless they've been taken part in a contact tracing episode. And the progression to active TB, whereby the individual develops symptoms and do, will become aware of that tuberculosis, can take anywhere from months to, to, to even decades. Now the focus of the, sc the screening program that I'm going to talk about today is on active tuberculosis. So it's been looking at detecting and treating active cases of TB in, the, in, in migrants. And it's based on a pilot program that the UK government started in 2005. And in 2005, they started working with the International Organization for Migration to screen, as part of the visa application process, migrants for active pulmonary and non-pulmonary TB as part of the visa application process. So just to quickly tell you about how this scheme works, because I'm sure it's not, uh, many of you haven't encountered it before. As part of the visa application process, an individual was required to undergo a chest x-ray. Now, if that chest x-ray showed no signs of TB, they were given a medical clearance certificate and allowed to then go on and be given their visa. If the chest x-ray was suspicious of TB and the, the physician seeing that migrant and conducting the screening thought that it may be suspicious of active pulmonary TB, they were required to undergo sputum testing uh, to, to, to diagnose whether they had TB or not. If they didn't have TB, they were given their medical certificate of clearance. But migrants detected with TB were not given that clearance and were required to undergo the normal treatment. They were referred to local clinics in these 15 countries, and they could then be repeat screened at a minimum of six months later. So there's been this pilot program, and what we first wanted to understand was, well, what does the existing literature tell us about pre-entry screening? So the first part of the research was to undertake a systematic review and meta-analysis of pre-entry screening programs. 
And unsurprisingly, you might think, what we found is that in countries where there's a higher background prevalence of TB in these countries, you detect more prevalent active tuberculosis at pre-entry. But what we did find, and what this forest plot doesn't show, is that there was a great deal of variation within these different programs. But none of the data on this forest plot here includes any, any data from the 15 pilot countries taking part in the UK pre-entry screening program. So the next thing we did was we looked at the, 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 the UK pre-entry screening program and in these 15 countries. Now the red bars here show the, the World Health Organization estimates of tuberculosis in these 15 countries. And in blue are the prevalent case rates, detection rates, by the pre-entry pre screening program. And with the exception of a couple of countries, Thailand and Eritrea, what you see is that actually the detection rates of active TB pre-entry in these migrant programs was lower than the WHO estimated, estimates for, for those countries. Now that's not actually that surprising because although this is a, a vulnerable group, compared to the rest of the population, they're actually probably wealthier and of a higher socioeconomic status. And we know that TB is still a disease of poverty. So this finding is not that unsurprising. But really what we wanted to know, and the main focus of the results that I'm going to show you today is once you've detected the active t prevalent cases in these individuals, what happens to them once they've arrived in the UK? Do they go on to develop TB or not? So to do this, many there's many data linkage studies that allow you to find uh, people across different data sets. And what I was aiming to do was link the records from this pre-entry screening program when, and using the data set that they had as part of that pre-entry screening program, which included over 640,000 migrants. I wanted to link that to the UK tuberculosis register. Now, there's no unique identifying variable to do that, such as an NHS number. So finding people across these two data sets is, a, is quite difficult. So I, I worked on a system, a, a, a piece of software called probabilistic linkage, which allows you to work out how probable it is that two individuals across two data sets are the same individual based on their name, date of birth, sex, and country of origin. And what we found here is the sensitivity of this process is around about 96%, so extremely sensitive, and has a specificity of, of 100%. So using that probabilistic linkage method, we were able to link these two data sets, and we ended up with over 500,000 migrants within the cohort. So the cohort was constructed in the way that individuals entered it upon pre-entry screening in their country of origin. We excluded, as with normal, uh, as you do within most cohort studies, anyone with the disease of, con of interest at the start of, of the study. So anyone with TB detected didn't enter the cohort. We had various risk factors from the pre-entry screening process, including when they were screened, whether they declared that they were in contact with another case of TB or not, and what their x-ray result was. And we then followed them up virtually in the UK to see whether they went on to develop active TB or not. So what did we find? Well, we started off with 500, over 500,000 migrants. And as you can see, that the vast majority of these did not end up with tuberculosis. But we did find 1,873 cases of active TB after migration, which is with an incidence rate of 147 per 100,000. Now that's helpful, but there are various forms of TB that are actually, if we're thinking about improving the migrant screening program, that we'd like to know more about. So pulmonary TB, as a, as, a, as a public health physician, I'm interested in pulmonary TB because this is the infectious form of the disease, and we want to know how many of cases of pulmonary TB were uh, diagnosed subsequently in the UK in this population. And we found 625 cases with an incidence rate of 49 per 100,000. Now that's helpful and that's interesting, but we were also able to include uh, using the DNA fingerprinting that's been available within the UK tuberculosis register since 2010, we were able to look at the molecular epidemiolo epidemiology of these cases to understand whether these were cases that were likely to be latent progression of disease onto active TB. And those cases where the, the, the DNA fingerprinting was unique, the assumption in this situation is that they were reactivation TB. And we found 301 cases of this, or 46 per 100,000. 
Now, these cases are important because at the moment, as I mentioned, we're just looking for active TB. And this form of TB here is potentially preventable if there was the introduction of a latent testing and screening program. Now, there's a lot of negative media about TB in migrants. And the final group that we looked at was transmission of TB. So how many of these cases of TB in the migrant population went on to spread TB to the population. And if you read the Daily Mail, you would think it was 100% of these cases. Well, actually, we found 35, okay? So of the 1,873 cases of TB, only 30, 35 of them had any indication of going on to spread TB. So whilst they have, they clear, these migrants clearly have an increased personal risk of TB, they do not go on and spread to TB to the population. So that's the incidence rates of TB, but really we want to know a bit more about when this TB is occurring, if we're going to be thinking about how to design and improve the screening program. So this, for the first time, enables us to look at the tuberculosis over time since migration. What you'll see is that actually in the first years since migration, there's a dip and it peaks at three. This is because probably we're removing the prevalent cases as part of the screening program, but individuals, their peak risk is at three years and it goes on and, st and starts to decline after that. But it's still relatively high after seven years, although the power of the study at that point becomes rather weak, exemplified by the wide confidence intervals that you see here. So that's the, in that's the rates and the how they change over time. But what risk factors are there for TB after migration? What we found is that those migrants declaring pre-entry that they'd been in contact with another case of TB, unsurprisingly, were at increased risk, three times the risk of TB subsequently in the UK. And those migrants with a chest x-ray that at the time of screening were suspicious of TB, and these are individuals that were negative bacteriologically at the time, so they did not have active TB, they were still at three times the increased risk of TB compared to those that didn't have chest x-ray changes. Those migrants from lower prevalence countries, so migrants from, a, from the lower incident prevalence countries were at reduced risk compared to those migrants from higher incidence countries, and finally, during the course of the pilot program in these 15 countries, they introduced sputum culture testing. So in the first years of the test, it was just smear testing, and culture testing is obviously a more sensitive test. And what, they, what we found was that migrants screened uh, with the culture test were also at a reduced risk of TB after migration to the UK. So that gives us some ideas of the rates and the risk factors for TB. But we also want to know, well, what could we potentially prevent? And what we have here is, is, a, is some mathematical modelling that looks at both the active and a potential introduction of a latent infection screening programme. So in grey, you have the, the cases that we're preventing through active TB screening. In red is the onward transmission cases that are prevented by the latent and active TB screening. And in blue is what, the theory, what we predict would be prevented in terms of reactivation and prevention if we were to introduce a latent screening program. Now, over the course of 15 years, we predict that it's 15,000 cases that can be prevented, or roughly 1,000 cases a year. Now, in the UK at the moment, we have just over 8,000 cases of TB. So this isn't going to eliminate tuberculosis, but it's certainly going to contribute and help towards that goal if it was introduced. So what can we conclude? Well, we conclude that pre-entry screening migrants clearly pose a negligible, very small risk of onward transmission, contrary to media and popular belief. But migrants do have an ongoing increased risk of personal risk of tuberculosis. And if we were to introduce a latent screening program, the, the risk factor analysis gives us some groups that this should be targeted at. We think that migrants from high incidence countries should be a potential target. Those obviously with the chest x-ray suspicious of TB should be a target. And those with a, a, a close household contact history also clearly uh, should be a focus of this program. And if it was introduced, clearly given the, the history of over time of TB, that we, we think that it should be considered, uh, there should be consideration for a catch-up programme for migrants that have been in the country for up to five or six years. But what are the wider implications of this research, and how can we turn this research evidence into action? Something I'm particularly keen about. Well, I think politically, 
if you don't know about disease in the population, it's easy to ignore. And I think using these methods, we can start to understand what the burden of, of, of disease is in migrants, but also we can start to use these tools uh, and methods for tracking in other populations, such as the homeless group, to make these invisible populations visible. There's scientific uh, implications. These, obviously, for example, multiple sclerosis has this history potential of latitude and where you come from, and these tools could allow us to start to think about these scientific problems and understand the, 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 the uses of the, that, that methodology in this group. I believe that this, the results could be used within clinical decision tools, helping clinicians that are seeing a migrant with TB in their clinic understand what potential risk they're at using these data. Um, and it may also help an individual decide whether they want to go undergo testing and treatment for latent infection. And there are various health improvement programs, not such as the ones I've just described, but also, again, in homeless populations, we can use these methods to identify what the health outcomes are and how we can start to improve the health by tracking disease in these mobile populations. I'm working towards turning this evidence into action with partners such as Public Health England, the International Organisation for Migration, and the WHO, and hopefully by using this research, we can start to improve the health of this vulnerable population. Thanks very much.